Hello everyone from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. My name is Ashley Fortune and I would like to welcome you to today's broadcast of the NCC WSC's Climate Change Science and Management Webinar Series. This series is held in partnership with the U.S. Geological Survey's National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center. Today's webinar will focus on the topic of managing the nation's fish habitat at multiple spatial scales in a rapidly changing environment and climate. We will introduce our four speakers momentarily, but first I would like to remind you of a few logistical details. First, this webinar will be recorded and it will be available approximately one to two weeks after the presentation. Holly Padgett will send you all an email once the recording is posted. Second, the speakers will be providing their contact information at the end of the presentation, so you will also have that. All of your phones are currently on a global mute and they will continue to be so during the presentation so we can hear the speakers. The speakers will uh, be showing the presentation full screen. However, you can always return to the main screen by pressing the back arrow. This will allow you to use the chat feature if you have any questions during the presentation. At the end of each presentation, we will open the conference for your questions and then the speakers will respond to any chat questions or comments at that time. If you would like um, all the attendees to see the comment or questions that you have posted, please remember to use the drop down arrow and select all participants. This is located in the send to line. All right, now without further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Sean Carter, Senior Scientist at the USGS National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center in Reston, Virginia. Sean, would you please introduce our speakers? Great, I'd be happy to, and thank you, Ashley. Uh, today, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, four speakers that are representing a second component of a large project that we funded. Um, the first speaker, Yin Fan Sang, is a research associate at Michigan State University, and her research involves linking hydrology and aquatic ecosystems and investigating physical processes related to climate and land use change. She currently has research projects in the Northeast Climate Science Center and also a national gap analysis program. Damon Kruger is a research associate with Michigan State as well. His work includes predicting the effects of climate and land use change on stream fish habitat and Midwestern streams. He's currently conducting an assessment of uh, Columbia River Basin Salmonids with respect to habit habitat conditions and interspecific interactions. Our third speaker, Bill Herb, is a research associate at the University of Minnesota St. Anthony Falls Lab and his research interests focus on computer modeling of hydrology and water quality, including the prediction of urbanization impacts on stream hydrology and temperature, and projection of climate change impacts on fish habitat. And last but not least, uh, Dana Infante is assistant professor at the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife at Michigan State, and her interests and research uh, include understanding the influences of landscape factors on stream fish and their habitats, uh, in addition to being a co-principal investigator on this project um, that's going to be discussed today, she also is leading a condition assessment of the nation's rivers which are being conducted for the National Fish Habitat Partnership. So uh, four wonderful speakers that we're going to hear from next, and with that I'd like to uh, turn it over to you all. Dana, go right ahead. Thanks very much, Ashley, and thank you all for joining us on the call today. Um, as Sean mentioned, I'm going to be speaking of, about a large, multifaceted project called Managing the Nation's Fish Habitat at Multiple Spatial Scales in a Rapidly Changing Climate. Those of you who were on the call last month got um, an overview of a portion of this project, and it's my privilege today to um, help introduce the components that comprise the rest of it. Um, I'm going to switch to full screen. While the previous slide showed many of the principal investigators on this project, the teams that these PIs are part of are led by some really amazing folks who did the majority of the research, the data management, the data compilation. Today you're going to be hearing from um, William Herb, Infan Singh, and Damon Kruger, and I'd also mention that there are others on the call who have contributed again to a lot of the data and the analysis. I 
As Sean mentioned, this is a multifaceted effort that occurred throughout the conterminous United States. The emphasis of this project was to perform a multi-scale analysis that helped that to help provide differential pieces of information that could be used collectively to assess impacts of potential changes in climate and land use on aquatic habitats. The scales or facets to this project are represented by the notion of focusing on populations, larger scale work targeting regional fish communities, and a national scale assessment that was intended to provide a backdrop or estimate of changes in conditions in areas that were not addressed by the regional efforts. In the previous call, we focused on the two studies targeting populations and on a regional study in the lower Colorado River Basin. And today, our speakers are going to be talking about an assessment occurring in upper Midwest cold water lakes, one targeting upper Midwest streams and stream fishes, and then an overview of the national assessment that we conducted. I wanted to mention elements of the data that have proved critical to all of these various regional and national assessments that we've conducted. There were two pieces of information that were developed specifically for this project by PIs and teams of researchers. These included downscaled climate projections. And with these downscaled climate data, the researchers were able to use estimates of changes in water temperature and stream flow regimes in some cases to estimate potential changes in aquatic habitat. We also had projected land use data that helped provide some context for understanding how additional changes could be, could be affecting fish and fish habitat. Again, these data were critical to all of the change assessments and essential for characterizing vulnerability to these projected future changes. Craig spoke about the details of our climate data and our land use change data last week, but I do want to mention that the climate models were downscaled by Steve Hostetler and his team. Um, we had three climate models to use at the national scale. They're listed on this slide. They include GenMom, the ECH AM5, and GFDL. The downscaled estimates were applied at a 15-kilometer grid. We summarized information, daily information, into multiple time steps over five year periods of time. And the variables that we had for use in the various change assessments included things like projections in air temperature, precipitation, soil moisture, evapotranspiration, et cetera. Development of the land use change data was led by Brian Pijanowski and his team at Purdue U University. They began with the 2001 National Land Cover Data Set as the base layer. Data were summarized at the 30 meter scale, and we had change estimates specifically for urban land use and land use, agricultural land use in 10 year increments. Urban land use was projected out to 2100, while agricultural land use change only went out to 2040. So with those core pieces of data available, again, projected changes in climate and projected changes in urban and agricultural land use, that was provided to the various teams for their respective work to describe changes in fish and fish habitat. I want to now introduce the speaker for the first regional study to be covered today. This is Dr. William Herb coming up next from the University of Minnesota and he will be speaking about changes in cold water lakes. Bill, are you off on mute? No, I'm not. I'm waiting for, uh, let's see. OK, I do have control now. Thank you. Uh, so I will be speaking today about the, a project looking at cold water fish habitat in lakes in the Midwestern region. Uh, Lucinda Johnson at the University of Minnesota Duluth was the principal investigator on this project. And then uh, our collaborators included 
uh, Don Pereira and uh, Keith Jacobson at the Minnesota DNR and Heinz Steffen at the University of Minnesota. And I will go to full screen here. And talk about the goals of the project. First of all, we wanted to um, take a look at how future land use change might impact nutrient loading and uh, lake trophic status in these Midwestern cold water lakes. And then um, make some projections about how these changes in trophic status uh, will impact cold water fish habitat uh, along with expected uh, climate changes. Our uh, cold water fish species of interest for this study included uh, tulabi or cisco, lake whitefish, and lake trout. The, um, the, this diagram describes kind of the, the, the physical connection between nutrient loading and cold water fish habitat where uh, phosphorus loading coming in from the lake shed uh, promotes plankton growth in the epilimnon of lakes as the plankton grow and die off, they, they sink towards the bottom of the lake and start decaying, and that depletes uh, oxygen in the hypolimnion of the lake where the cold water fish uh, like to live. Um, and so increases in uh, phosphorus loading can increase productivity in the lake and increase this oxygen depletion in the hypolimnion. So that, that effect kind of build on any temperature increases in the lake due to, due to climate change and, and longer open water seasons and things like that. Our study lakes uh, spanned three states, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan, and four ecoregions. Uh, most of the lakes in our study are in the Northern Lakes and Forest uh, ecoregion and the North Central Hardwood Forest ecoregion. And I, I should say when I, when I when I say cold water lakes, I mean uh, lakes that have populations of these fish species, cisco, lake trout, and lake whitefish. Um, of the 1,154 lakes that we identified uh, for the study, about 250 had sufficient uh, phosphorus data and so forth to be included in our, our phosphorus loading model. The, one of the major pieces of the study was to put together a model for relating land use and climate to phosphorus loading and in lake concentrations of phosphorus and trophic status. Uh, to do this, we used uh, linear mixed model regression relationships. Uh, we made one regression relationship for each ecoregion. Um, using log transform variables, the significant lake shed variables in these regressions were urban fraction, corn fraction, forest fraction, and then annual runoff depth or precipitation depth as a, a climate-based parameter. Um, the regressions were based on in-lake phosphorus concentration observations from 1990 to 2008, and what we were predicting in the regression relationships was actually a, a annual phosphorus loading rate to the lakes, and then I converted that to an in-lake concentration subsequently. Uh, you can see at the bottom of this slide that the R squared of our predicted concentrations uh, ranged from 0.55 to 0.68, depending on whether you look at it at a, on a linear scale or a log scale. So the the in lake concentration predictions turned out uh, quite well. With in lake concentrations in hand, uh, the next task was to relate these to actual cold water fish habitat. And to do this, we used a parameter called TDO3, which is the temperature in the lake at, at the depth where DO is equal to 3 milligrams per liter. Um, for cold water fish species, you want this to be a low temperature, meaning that there is sufficient oxygen down in, in, in the deeper parts of the lake where the uh, temperature is suitable for these species. Um, this TDO3 parameter can be uh, extracted from temperature DO profile measurements in lakes. 
um, and it has been found to be a good predictor of cold water species presence and absence. Uh, TDO3 can also be empirically estimated from regression relationships using air temperature, uh, in-lake phosphorus concentration, and a couple other parameters. Uh, so that, that empirical model is, is the coupling we get between in-lake phosphorus concentration and, and cold water habitat. And this, this is all work uh, primarily done by Pete, Peter Jacobson at the Minnesota DNR. He went further to uh, relate this TDO3 parameter to a, a habitat score specific to each cold water lake species, and uh, where, where 100 habitat score is excellent habitat and, and zero is very poor habitat. And you can see in this figure that uh, Cisco are actually the most tolerant species for warmer or, or higher values of TDO3, whereas lake trout are, are the least tolerant of higher temperatures. So with the uh, phosphorus loading model in hand and a, a, this, this TDO3 empirical relationship in, in hand, we are then in a position to make some projections about future cold water lake habitat. Uh, and in particular, we can use future land use uh, as an input to the phosphorus loading model, future climate data as input to both the phosphorus loading model and the TDO3 model, um, and um, calculate the future changes in phosphorus concentration and then the corresponding changes in TDO3 and these, these habitat scores. Uh, and we have done that for the combined effects of climate and land use, and then kind of broken it down into individual responses, as we will see. The inputs to the model are the, the land use and climate data that Dana already uh, mentioned, so I will gloss over the slide a bit, other than to say that both the land use data and the climate change data ended up being quite important in determining our, our lake responses. So I will go through some results now. Uh, I am going to focus on results obtained using the GenMom model uh, climate data. The, I, will, I will focus on the northern lakes and forest and north central hardwood ecoregions because that's where most of the cold water lakes are. And I will focus on Cisco habitat because that is the, the species we were most interested in for this, this particular study. So let's look at some driving variables first. Uh, in Northern Lakes and Forest ecoregion, uh, the plot on the left shows the change in air temperature uh, summarized in 20-year blocks for, for each uh, lake in the Northern Lakes and Forest ecoregion. And you can see from the historical period to 2080 that we are getting uh, a median increase in air temperature of about two and a half degrees Celsius uh, but with quite a bit of, of, of variation across the region. The, if you look at the graph on the right, uh, that shows the projected change in in-lake phosphorus concentration uh, for the northern lakes and forest lakes. And you can see in this plot that actually the median concentration, that, that dark line in the box plot, doesn't really change very much. So. Land use change was not really generally a big deal for the northern lakes and forest lakes, but there are outliers uh, that did see uh, quite high impact of land use and subsequent increase in, uh, in lake phosphorus concentration. So now we can look at the responses for northern lakes and forest lakes. Uh, the graph on the left shows the decrease in the uh, Cisco habitat score for these lakes projected all the way out to 2080. Uh, you can see going out to 2080 that the median lake decreases by a score of about 15 out of 100. So that's, that's a fairly significant decrease, but there's also a great range of, of variation on these decreases where some, some lakes are impacted much more and some are impacted much less. The uh, <clears throat> Lake response 
in 2080 is shown in the map on the right. And two things to notice here are, number one, there's a, there's a gradient of response from east to west so that the, the Minnesota lakes are getting hit a bit harder than Wisconsin and Michigan. And that is because of the, the, uh, the, the changes in air temperature are, are a bit more in, in uh, particularly northern Minnesota. Also, you can see that there are some the red dots uh, towards the southern end of the northern lakes and forest ecoregion, and those are lakes uh, getting hit by some agricultural production creeping its way north. So uh, now turning our attention briefly to the north central hardwood forest lakes, uh, the changes in air temperature on the plot on the left are fairly comparable to the Northern Lakes Forest, just a little bit less increase in air temperature, but on the order of two to two and a half degrees Celsius. However, looking at the plot on the right of uh, change in in-lake phosphorus concentration, you can see that um, there is a, a significant increase in, in phosphorus concentrations on the order of, of 10 to 20 micrograms per liter. Uh, with some variation between lakes, but uh, the, the median value does see a uh, very significant change compared to northern lakes and forests. So it, that is due to the combination of urbanization and increased agricultural production. Looking at the response of these north central hardwood forest lakes, uh, on, the, on the left, once again, is the change in the Cisco habitat score. You can see these decreases are a bit higher now uh, on the order of uh, 20 to 25 uh, points out of 100. Um, on, the, on the right, you can see, the once again, the distribution of the lake responses across the region by lake. Um, you can see that actually that most of the the, the lakes in this ecoregion are in Minnesota, but within that area, there is actually quite a variety and, and range of responses once again. This last results slide summarizes the, um, the response of the, or the, the, the median response in habitat to land use and climate change for each ecoregion. So this is kind of the, the typical lake response in each of the four ecoregions in the study. And so, for example, you can see uh, in the northern lakes and forest ecoregion in the upper left that uh, the response, the combined response of the habitat score is mainly due to air temperature, uh, whereas the res individual response to urbanization and corn production is, is almost insignificant in that ecoregion. In the, uh, for example, the southwestern, southern Minnesota, sorry, southern Wisconsin Till Plains ecoregion, directly below that in the lower left, you can see that the response of these lakes to urbanization, corn production, and air temperature increases are all pretty comparable in size, and they add up to be a, a significant number. So, depending on what ecoregion you're in, the the land use. Uh, change impacts are, are more or less significant. So to summarize, uh, overall air temperature increases tend to have the biggest impact on cold water habitat in these lakes according to our models. Uh, however, in, in many regions, urbanization and increased agriculture can also have very significant impacts. It's more of a, a localized effect compared to air temperature. Uh, overall, Habitat in the Minnesota lakes is projected to change a bit more than the other two states because of the, the increased change in air temperature, but there is great diversity in the lake responses within this region. The results I gave here today are for the 255 lakes that were included in the, the phosphorus loading model, and we're currently working on ways to expand that out to a larger set of lakes. So that uh, concludes my portion of the presentation. I can take questions now uh, or at the end of the webinar. Excellent. Thank you, Bill. Um, if you guys have any questions 
Bill, can you just go ahead and press that stop button and bring us back to that main screen? Thank you. And um, you guys can text chat your questions right now for Bill, or you can wait until the end, or you can use the uh, raise hand icon that's located between the participant list and the chat box, and we you can ask your question over the phone. If you are planning on uh, asking your question over the phone, just remember to take off the global mute by pressing star six when I call on you. We have a question from Joy that says, are there methods to reduce phosphorus loading to the affected streams? And the answer to that question is, is yes. And um, one of the motivations for this project was to help the, the Minnesota DNR and the DNRs in other states to uh, prioritize their uh, strategies for, say, buying up land to help protect particular lakes and particular streams. So uh, if there are particular lakes of interest, then they can uh, perhaps acquire parcels of land to, to protect that land from development in the future. Uh, when development does happen, there are certainly best management practices that can be used for both agriculture and urbanization to reduce phosphorus exports. And we have another question from Jordan. It says, how well does the TD03 model reproduce dynamics and historical measurements? Uh, the TD03 model was developed by Peter Jacobson at the Minnesota DNR. Um, the, the model makes projections over relatively long periods of time, say 10 to 20 years of average data. Um, but I believe that the, the R squared of these relationships that he developed is, was on the order of, of uh, 0.6 or so. And then we have another one from Gretchen that says, can you tell us a little more about the species-specific habitat scores that were generated? Yeah, those were, uh, again, this is work by Peter Jacobson, and he, he basically had a, uh, a quite, quite a lot of in-lake uh, fish sampling data, uh, along with a lot of temperature and dissolved oxygen profiles from these lakes. So basically, you um, uh, look at a, a number of lakes and determine what the, the TDO3 parameter was in the lake uh, and perhaps average that over a number of years and then look to see if that lake has particular cold water species. And by compiling this data together um, and doing uh, logistic regression models, you can uh, create these, these habitat scores, which, which are basically the probability of, of presence of these, these particular fish in, in, a, in a lake with a particular value of, of TDO3. And then we have one more from Mark, and it says, in addition to the change in wa water quality, are you also considering potential effects of changing water quality? Uh, e.g. via a water supply and stress index model. Oh, so are we considering water quantity? Is that the question? Yes, quantity. Okay. Uh, we, we did not do a lot of work uh, on, on this, uh, on, on that particular uh, aspect. Um, in, in general, the um, climate change forecasts, if, if anything, show slight or, or moderate increases in precipitation in the future. Um, so we, we're not expecting a drastic change in, in, in you know, annual average stream flows and, and lake levels. Um, but that would certainly be, be something to look at in the future if we had 
uh, some good hydrology models in, in hand. Uh, but no, we, we have not looked at that yet. All right, Mark says thank you. And then we have, we'll take one more from Gretchen, and it says, did you use lake-specific input data besides TP and air temperature to predict lake-specific responses, such as depth, area, et cetera? Yes, we did. Um, the data that we used for each lake included uh, lake morphometry data, uh, the, the lake area, the mean depth, and the maximum depth. Uh, it also included the uh, lake shed area. So we, for, for the land use parameters, we had to um, attribute the, the, the future land use projections over the, the, the local and cumulative lake shed areas and use that in the, 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 the loading models and also to predict things like residence time. Uh, so there was actually quite a few uh, lake specific parameters used and I'm actually right now in the process of trying to develop some, uh, to, to kind of sort out which lakes tend to respond the most and which lakes tend to respond the least to these land use and climate change impacts. Thank you. I'm going to turn it back over to Dana. And then uh, if you guys have any more questions, we will be taking them again uh, at the conclusion of the rest of the presentations. Thanks, Dana. Thanks a lot. That's the next slide. So just a broad sort of take home point regarding Bill's presentation. He did an excellent job of sharing with us specifically how some of these cold water lake habitat characteristics are likely to change with projected changes in climate and land use. And I just want to emphasize that these results represent specific mechanisms by which changes are likely to affect valued fish species within these systems. Um, the next speaker is going to shift system types and speak a little bit about streams of the region. And with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Damon Kruger, who will be talking next. Thanks, Dana. Thanks, everybody, for joining the call. I'm going to talk about uh, some of the work that I've done previously, which is an attempt to assess the effects of climate and land use changes on some Midwestern streamfish habitat. So like the other studies that have been discussed thus far, this is a regional study, again, comprising a um, large area of Minnesota, Michigan, and Wisconsin, which is a little bit more than 120,000 stream reaches as determined by confluence to confluence or uh, confluence to termination. Um, there are diverse stream types in the region. Uh, that's likely due to having three level one ecoregions present. Uh, there's four different thermal classes if you consider the uh, cool water transitional streams. Of course, there's a characteristic fish assemblages that would go along with each of those the uh, different uh, thermal classes in in addition to the different regional assemblages. And then, of course, this area is, is quite unique in terms of its groundwater resources that are quite abundant in the region that sets us apart quite a bit from uh, the remaining areas of the country. So one of our main objectives was to use fish species as a, uh, a quote-unquote surrogate measure for in-stream habitat. This is simply because it's very difficult to go through and sample in-stream habitat, especially when you're talking about over 120,000 stream reaches, uh, so thousands upon thousands of miles of, of stream reaches. Um, instead, we can use landscape scale measures to try to quantify some of this in-stream habitat uh, by making uh, correlative predictions. Um, and so what we wanted to do was identify changes in fish habitat that were due to projected climate and land use changes. And those were things that, uh, that Dana had touched on before, climate coming from Steve Hostetler out at Oregon State and land use changes coming from Brian Pijanowski and, and crew over at Purdue. Perhaps the most important thing that we wanted to do was to share appropriate information with uh, watershed managers, lake managers, um, basically just resource managers. And uh, the reason for that is, is that there's such an overabundance of climate data and maybe even land use data. And it's, it's tough to actually say what you can do with this data or with these data. So what our goal was was to try to make climate data usable where it counts, to say, 
here's what we think is going to happen based on these climate projections, and, uh, and here are some suggestions for how you might be able to ameliorate or, um, or otherwise for, for these different areas. Uh, so jumping right into how I actually determined what happens in response to these climate changes and land use changes, the first aspect was to model stream temperature. In or order to do this, I used an artificial neural network, uh, and that was the iQuest software from Advanced Data Mining Incorporation. And um, the data requirements are actually relatively minimal with respect to some of the mechanistic models that you may have read about. Uh, this, this, of course, would be nearly impossible to do a mechanistic type model because of the scope um, and as well as the data that would be required. Uh, you can see in this case that there were um, about 800 sites for Michigan, 500 for Minnesota, and 377 for the state of Wisconsin. And those actually were quite sufficient in order to, uh, to build this correlative type model that would be able to take in daily data uh, that, that was actually collected from these streams along with the landscape data and the climate data. And then it could, uh, as an output, spit out, again, daily stream temperature data. And from there, we can essentially make a limitless number of metrics that would describe the stream temperature regime of any given uh, stream that, for which we have data. And then from there, we could actually go and, um, and actually use this model to predict the daily mean stream temperature uh, for all streams in the region. Um, again, this was a, a pretty efficient way in which to predict stream temperature. We had an R-square of around 0.75, which is actually quite good, especially for state-scale models. And I believe that's something I forgot to, uh, to say, is that each of these states uh, had a different model associated with it. But they all performed about equally well. <clears throat> Uh, for the stream flow models, what I did is not, an, uh, not a neural network model like I did for the stream temperature, but instead to use a multiple linear regression method that Paul Seelbach and Leon Hintz kind of came up with for an analysis of Illinois, Wisconsin, and Michigan streams several years ago. Uh, so they actually predicted exceedance flows. And again, this is a state-by-state -state model, and we developed, or I developed, three different models for each state. One would describe the mean annual flow, one would describe the spring peak flow, and then the last would describe the summer low flow. Um, you can see that there are considerably fewer sites associated with each of these states. Uh, and so Michigan was about 120, Minnesota 71, and Wisconsin about 85. And um, these were all from the USGS gauge, gauge stations. And uh, there are actually quite a few more gauge stations present within each state. Uh, but based on all the criteria that we put forth, these were the number of, of, st of sites that actually satisfied those criteria and then were able to actually be used in our modeling analysis. Uh, so again, the USGS gauge data were used uh, as, as required data, as well as precipitation data, which we got from two different sources. One was the PRISM data, which we used as our quote-unquote current data, and then we used three different uh, AOGCMs, or, or the general circulation models, uh, the downscaled versions of those from Hostetler et al. Uh, that Dana talked about before. Again, we use land use data from Pijanowski, and then we also use several layers of uh, landscape data that w are present at the national scale. And again, these models all, all performed quite well, um, upwards of about 90% for R-squared for, for some of the models, and maybe down to about 75% for some of the others. But again, in general, they, they performed very well, especially for state-level models. Uh, finally, we can determine how fish actually respond to, the ver to these different changes in thermal and flow regimes of these various uh, streams. Um, so what we did was to actually use species groups and, uh, and to group them together to get kind of more of a, an ecosystem-based approach to management rather than a species-by-species -species management approach. Uh, you can see there's quite a few data points for, for uh, different arcs with fish. Um, over 5,000 points altogether for all three different states. So we were able to uh, make some pretty strong models, quite uh, as a matter of fact. We used uh, two different types primarily to, to model the distribution of fish species, and that was based on presence absence. So the first way was to use random forest, and this is a very 
a robust method because it uses thousands of trees and therefore is not driven by unusual circumstances, but rather it's driven by typical observations. So you're not, you're not being thrown off by outliers. We also use classification and regression trees, or CART. Um, this is, is fairly similar to random forest, but here we have uh, more of a variable prediction relationship that, that makes it so that you're actually looking at each tree as you build it. Uh, this allows you to interpret and explain kind of what's going on within each model and, and follow it step by step through. Um, so both have their bon both have their bonuses, both have uh, their negatives, but if used in tandem, I think that you can be pretty certain of uh, of an outcome, so to speak. Um, and then again, the predictions that we're getting are essentially the same for both models. Uh, we would use the best model whether it was CART or random forest. So whichever one had the highest score would have been used for that particular species group. And then each of the groups is, or each of the models is then predicting the presence absence um, for a given fish species. I'm sorry, for the given species group. So getting on to some of the results, what I'm showing here is the results for the stream temperature model. This is just one example and it shows the departures from current so from basically 1997 to 2042, how would these streams be predicted to change? Uh, and you can see it goes from a decrease of three and a half degrees, which you can see in central Minnesota, the dark blue, and all the way up to a three and a half degree increase in temperature, uh, which in this case doesn't look like there's a whole lot. Um, mostly it's gonna be, most of the increases are seen to be from a half to one and a half degrees. Uh, but at this time step, Oddly enough, there are a number of streams that show a cooling, along with a, a large number of streams that show a warming. And of course, uh, some of the differences between the states are somewhat noticeable. And again, that's likely due to the fact that each state was independently created instead of having simply one uh, stream model to, uh, to model the entire region. But if we then look at the next time step, which is 2062 for the same uh, AOGCM predictions, we can see there's a significant warming across the entire region. Uh, there is still that one patch in central Minnesota that shows a slight cooling, uh, but in general we see uh, quite a substantial warming throughout the entire region. Flow is a little bit harder to quantify, especially to visualize. Um, so I've, I've tried to just show uh, here is essentially the change in exceedance uh, again, departures from current from 1997 to 2062, which is the latter time step that I showed previously. Uh, and you can see that we go from no change, essentially, which is the, the grayish blue, all the way up to uh, the red, which I'll just call a large change. It's, it's kind of hard to, um, like I said, kind of hard to visualize this when it's uh, the cubic meters per second per, uh, per kilometer squared. Um, so this is the exceedance yield, I should specify. Um, so this is going to be uh, based on the area of the, of the stream itself. Uh, but again, you can see there's a pretty large increase throughout a pretty substantial portion uh, of the region. Now if we go and we plug those stream flow and stream temperature predictions into our fish models, um, first of all, we can look at what I've called the cold water, quote unquote, or uh, otherwise known as the species assemblage one, uh, which I found in, uh, from Travis Brennan et al. Uh, from a few years back. And um, this is essentially salmonid habitat. Uh, so here's a look at the current distribution of those cold water species. And um, I, I should mention that if there's one species present out of the group, then the group itself is proposed to be present in that uh, specific reach. So here you can see uh, the current distribution of those species. If we look forward to 2062, again based on just one of the AOGCMs, you can see that there's of course a substantial decrease in the distribution of those species uh, within the group. And again black is present and then all the gray areas are now absent. Um, another way that I think is, is helpful to look at it is by looking at whether the species was present originally and present in the predicted uh, time step. Uh, so what you see, black shows that it was present previously and is present in the future. Gray, of course, is absent both time steps. Blue shows a gain of habitat. There's only one small area in south, 
West Michigan that actually shows a gain of habitat. But then, by and large, you see um, a species that was present and then lost that habitat due to warming or flow or both, and uh, that's the red. So considerable habitat loss according to the, out, the outputs from this particular AOGCM. And so there are, of course, going to be more products coming from this particular work that I've been, that I've been doing. Um, again, we have predictions based on the output of three separate climate models, and those would be the GenMom, the EH5, or the ECHAM5, whatever you want to call it, and the GFDL. So that actually gives us a pretty good range of possible futures uh, from, from a cooler future to a very warmer future, perhaps, uh, or anything in between. Of course, we have stream temperature, which is, which is uh, predicted at daily time steps and, again, can be turned into just about limitless metrics that would describe the stream uh, temperature regime of the stream. Uh, the stream flow is, is uh, going to be uh, described by three primary metrics, which are going to be the Q50, Q10, and Q90 uh, exceedance metrics. And then we've also got, of course, the fish group distributions as well as the delta of those distributions. So how do they change across time? And um, I've got 15 different species groupings that describe various, uh, various metrics that describe the, screen, the stream. So fish that respond to flow, fish that respond to temperature, as well as um, uh, different metrics as well. Uh, we've got six different time steps that we can look at. The current, of course. And then 2022, 2032, 2042, 2062, and 2087. Uh, finally, we've got more or less a plug and play capability with this type of model format. Uh, this can be easily updated or expanded with new AOGCM results or land use results. Um, so again, we can incorporate new climate models. We can incorporate new ways to, to look at land use changes. Uh, and in that way, we can provide results fairly quickly and easily. So next comes the question of who uses this information. And we're hoping that a lot of people will use this information or at least maybe give us suggestions on, uh, on what could be useful. Um, so anyone from the US Forest, uh, US Forest Service, the Fish and Wildlife Service, state agencies have been very instrumental in getting this work up and going and, uh, and seem to have quite an interest in actually using this information as well. Um, the great thing about this type of modeling approach is that it allows for prioritization of fish habitat. So we can ask a number of different questions, such as whether these species or species groups have an economic or ecological or even cultural significance. We can look at areas of fish habitat and determine which are more appropriate for restoration and or conservation activities. And we can do this by looking at our predictions that would guess whether or not the good habitat now is also going to be good habitat in the future. Uh, one of the aspects of this project that, that we really decided to stick, stick to from the beginning was that our results are going to be uh, interpreted by those that use the results themselves and not by us. So this is really, these questions are, and the answers to them are really going to be up to the, to the managers themselves and how do they interpret and how do they place labels on uh, what's good change, what's bad change, uh, et cetera. Um, finally, something that's uh, fairly unique as well is that we can both identify problem locations with respect to habitat loss or gain, and um, we can also identify the mechanisms by which these changes are actually occurring. And because of that, we can allow management to act pretty effectively and efficiently. And so with that, I'd like to take any questions if there are any. Thank you, Damon. And uh, if everyone can just uh, look on the chat box, uh, Bill has amended his previous answer to the question about water quantity. We did do some sim very simple modeling of the projected annual runoff depth and found that increases in runoff depth tends to increase phosphorus loading, but that increase is offset by an increased lake flushing. All right, um, Mark has a question. Were projections of future stream temperatures stratified by flow source, i.e. spring fed southeast Minnesota versus surface runoff northeast Minnesota? Um, well, 
I, I guess yes and no. We, what I did was, I uh, I had to run different. Um, how should I say this? I had to do to choose variables that would describe the the uh, variability in stream temperature based on the thermal regime that exists currently. So essentially it would have been based on maybe a single year's worth of data, uh, maybe up to three or four years of data. Generally it would be based on one year of data and uh, what category it fell into, whether it was cold water, warm water, or uh, one of the transitional streams. Um, we did not build a separate model for cold water versus warm water streams, uh, if, if that's what the question is. Um, but what we did do is use an equal number of streams that came from each of those four different thermal habitat uh, categories. So I'm not sure, uh, hopefully that answers the question, I, but uh, if not, please, please let me know. Uh, I think it answered the question, Mark says thanks. We have a question from Joy, and it says, perhaps building and restoring more wetlands would help reduce uh, phosphorus loading to streams and lakes. I'm sorry, could you repeat that, please? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so we have a, a comment from Joy, and it says, perhaps building and restoring more wetlands would help reduce phosphorus loading to streams and lakes. Yeah, um, I, I assume that's for Bill, but I, I would guess that that's definitely the case. Okay. And this is okay. Bill, and I, I would agree with that statement. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bill. And then we have a question from Gretchen for Damon, and it says, can you explain on your last point? It seems like your statistical approaches to prediction are based on correlations between your temperature and flow metrics and presence absence. So how do you identify mechanisms? Um, so we could do that by holding some of the various metrics constant and changing others and see which are responsible for more of the variation in uh, now this could be this could be for temperature modeling for flow modeling or for the fish modeling so we could essentially look at uh, the mechanisms that that um, are responsible for a temperature variation for flow variation as well as for differences in the distribution of the fish species so let's say for a stream temperature for example um, I could plug in climate changes uh, based on one particular model and then I could hold land use constant in one in one run and then I could also throw in changing land use in another run and then look at the differences that would be attributed to uh, land use specifically and then I could do the opposite and determine what changes are attributed to uh, air temperature specifically. Um, we could do something similar with the species modeling but then it would just be a matter of looking at the differences in the uh, distribution of, of species and so in that case you might want to look at a finer scale to determine uh, maybe if there's a huck that you're interested in to see how uh, land use might influence the distribution of a particular species or a group in one particular huck versus another. Okay. And then we have a question from Thon or Tom, and it says, can you explain the projected cooling in central Minnesota? I cannot really, to be honest. Um, but what I can say is that no matter what climate model that we use, it is present in all of them. So uh, I'm, I'm thinking that um, something's there and, and something can, someone hopefully uh, better versed in Minnesota streams than me can explain that, but I unfortunately don't have a good answer for that, so I apologize. All right, uh, I don't see any more questions. I'm going to turn it back over to Dana. Thanks a lot, Ashley. Um, the next slide. So we've had two examples of great projects that have highlighted spatially explicit changes in habitat likely to occur with climate and land use changes. And I want to emphasize again that these projects, due to differences in data availability at these regional scales, really help suggest specific mechanisms of how these habitats are likely to change. Um, I'd mentioned that at a national scale, 
in certain regions, we don't have the luxury of having sufficient data available to characterize these changes in aquatic habitats. However, it's still critical to have a nationally consistent picture of what might occur, i.e. where changes might occur. With that, I'd like to introduce our next speaker who will be describing a national project, Dr. Infan Seng. Thanks, Dana. Um, for the following national assessment, I would like to first acknowledge my co-authors, Dana Infante, Lee Zhu Wan, Damon Kruger, Daniel Weefrich, and Bill Taylor. They have been instrumental in this analysis. So in the previous presentations, you have heard um, a uh, uh, great modeling and assessment work at the regional scale. However, we do know that the climate change is a um, global issue and its uh, impact on the ecosystem is actually won't stop at the boundaries. So we actually need a consistent method to describe these changes to allow us to compare those impacts and allow us to prioritize those management resources when we try to do the adapting the climate impact. So for today's talk, I would like to first describe the uh, assessment framework that we've done for this national scale assessment. And then I would like to uh, give you an idea about how this assessment result can be used and how can we use these results to link with other information for the management use. I will start my um, method part with the spatial framework that we use. The spatial framework is the foundation of this large scale analysis. We use the spatial framework, uh, the, the spatial framework is the key for us to managing, analyzing, and summarizing the data. We choose uh, the NHD plus as our spatial framework. It is a uh, one to 100,000 scale river coverage and the basic unit of NHD plus is the stream reaching. Uh, there are a total of 2.6 million reaches nationwide. And for each reaches, the area that flow into the local reaches, we call it local catchment. And for the area flow into the stream network, we call it network catchment. So each reaches, uh, they will have uh, attached to local and uh, associated network catchment. And using the spatial framework, we can later on, this is a demonstration of how we can summarize the information. So from local reach and catchment, we can aggregate, aggregate them into a, a large catchment or a large hydrologic unit. And we can continue to integrate it into uh, a, like a TNC EDUs or large eco regions or even to the state boundary. And we can even integrate them into a large scale eco region or even to a, a, a boundary that is interested to all the management units or partnerships. So, based on the spatial framework, also um, to base on the spatial framework, we're going to um, do our climate assessment at the national scale. As Dana and uh, every of the presenter before have mentioned that we have the climate data from Steve Hospitaller um, and he, used, uh, he modeled the climate projection using A2 scenario. One of the benefits of using these climate projections is that they provide a various variables for us to use in the assessment. For example, they have precipitation, air temperature, solar radiation, soil moisture, or growing degree day, et cetera. On the other hand, um, we have more than 13,000 fish sites nationwide. This is an effort supported by uh, National Fish Habitat Partnership and USGS National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center. We have a fish record between 1990 to 2010. Having these uh, information and data are great, but uh, we are still lacking something, that's the habitat. We all know that fish live in the stream and climate have to cast their influence on fish through the habitat. Habitat could be a lot of things. 
They could be water quality, sediment, or geology, superficial geology. But the two major components for uh, to affect fish and is related to climate are the flow and temperature. Therefore, we gather daily flow and temperature records um, to use in this assessment. We filter the daily flow data that have uh, daily flow gauges that have a uh, 10 year continuously data that without gaps more than five days. We then use the the daily flow and temperature data between 1990 to 2010 to use uh, in the analysis. These flow and temperature daily records were turned into 171 flow metrics and 141 temperature metrics to describe the habitat condition that related to fish. For example, they could be high flow, low flow, or a seasonal maximum minimum and mean temperature at the given location. We then link those um, flow and temperature gauge with the fish sample site that we have, um, and then we make sure the criteria is within 10 kilometers apart on the same size stream reaches and no dam between them. So now we have all the data we need, but we still need to build a linkage to say something about how climate will affect fish. We performed this assessment. Um, we used three questions to guide us to perform this assessment. The first question we, the first question we asked is that what, which habitat condition that, is, that fish will like and support their living. For example, we use indicator species analysis to understand that um, if fish is high, liking the high flow or low flow or different thermal condition at the region. We then ask that what kind of climate metrics that most strongly affecting or driving the habitat condition. For example, we use correlation analysis to find out that snow amount in the winter is highly uh, correlated to the maximum high flow in a year at a given location. And the last but not the least, uh, we want to know which climate uh, characteristic will change in the future. That will give us an idea that what will likely to change in the region. So by, by answering these three questions, we established the link among the climate, habitat, and the fish. We then confirm these relationships uh, using the literature. We also consult uh, expert opinion to make sure that those known relationships have been captured in this linkage. We then see in the, um, the selected climate metrics along with the responsive fish group, also the natural factor that like already known that important to fish into to run the multivariate regression tree, multivariate regression tree, MRT. By doing this, um, assessment from where we eventually will have a climate-driven fish habitat ecological classification. Uh, we have performed the previous assessment framework for the nine large ecoregions throughout the conterminous U.S. So each region will have their own climate-driven fish habitat classification that describe how the climate supporting the current fish habitat. And this is the close look of um, what are the natural factors have been used in those classifications. As you can see that they are different, um, every region have their different uh, natural, fa natural factor being used in their trees. But to, to see that they are the catchment area, Catchment area has been used for all the regions to do the classification. Here is another close look on the climate metric that we use in the classification. Just to point out that, um, as we mentioned it before, th these climate models allow us to have a wide selection of climate metrics. So we have used like rainfall or no rainfall days. <clears throat> Excuse me. Snow, air temperature, growing degree day, or extreme tem temperature day counts. 
or the ground water, uh, sorry, the ground temperature. And each of the climate metrics have been used differently throughout the region. So now that we have all the um, stream habitat classification for all nine large regions, and then we can apply the future climate projections on these classifications. We define that a change in the stream class is indicate a potential change in the uh, hydrological and thermal condition due to climate. We have three models and in multiple time steps. The GMO model is actually the most conserv conserv conservative model. And um, just a reminder that we have performed this analysis uh, at the reach by reach scale. And um, it's allowed us to summarize in a large unit uh, because of our spatial framework. In the following, I'm going to show you the GMO result in a HUG-12 unit. So this is the fish habitat projection in 2020. We know that we have fewer um, fish sample at the large river site, and we don't feel comfortable to project the habitat change at those large rivers. Therefore, they are showing us no results as blank on the map. And for the gray area, those are the um, stream habitat that shows no change in 2020. And for the pinkish and or a pinkish purple, those are the area that have showing hydrological, a hydrologic or thermal habitat change by climate. And this is the result in 2020. And this is in 2030, 40, 60, and 2090. So. By having this information, we actually can see that the change across different regions at the national scale. But what else we can see from this projection? This is an example at the North Appalachian region that is showing the, cha the habitat change due to the changing in growing degree day, the uh, growing degree day in the summer. The growing degree day is the amount of accumulated heat and the color you're showing here that if it's lighter yellow, it means that it was decreasing uh, number in the growing degree day. And the darker yellow or orange is a gaining of growing degree day at the area. Um, so manager at the region can base on this information to consider like riparian zone buffer to accommodate those uh, potential change at the area. And this is another example at the upper Midwest region. And this is the color is showing the change, uh, the area that have ch might have uh, well changed due to the increasing or decreasing snow in the winter. Darker color means that the, uh, it, it indicates that there will be an increasing snow in the winter. And the lighter color means that there will be a decreasing snow in the winter. And just to remind you that this is not just a climate change, a climate projection. This is a projection of fish habitat will change due to the increasing or decreasing snow in the winter. And also we have found that this is highly related to the timing of the annual maximum flow in the area. So for the manager in the area, they could use this information to consider different, like a detention pound for the uh, potential high flow or consider to limit the water withdrawal at the area that will decrease in the snow in the winter. So here, just to uh, a quick summary about this framework that we have been used at the national scale. We have quantitatively analyzed the available data, and this approach allows us to, do a, uh, to flexibly inco incorporate the knowledge that we have known from literature or expert. And we have done this assessment reach by reach, but this, uh, the spatial framework allows us to apply to local or large scale, which will allow us to do comparison across region. And the last but not the least, when we have better information like fish or flow or climate, we can always improve this assessment. The, the last slide that I want to show here is that um, 
due to the time limit, I didn't have a uh, I didn't have a time to show the land use change result. But I just want to give you an idea that having this nationwide uh, climate projection uh, habitat cha uh, habitat change projection due to climate, we can compare them with those habitat change due to land use, and at the same time, let's not forget that we actually have the habitat condition at the current uh, habitat, fish habitat current condition score as well. So combine all the info, uh, all the better, uh, the best information we have, we can do a better informed uh, decision when we try to do um, prioritize our resource across region at the large scale. Thank you. If I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Infam. Um, could you press the stop button and bring us back to the main page? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. All right. Does anybody have any questions? They can be pertaining to Infam's presentation or either of the other two presentations. All right, we'll wait for just another minute or so in case people are typing. Alrighty, Dana, did you have any conclusions? I just want to provide a few quick closing points. And we've had some great presentations today about mechanisms of change occurring in Midwestern lakes and streams. In Fan's work described a broad approach showing potential changes due to potential responses of thermally and hydrologically sensitive groups of species. And these differences in part were derived by differences in data available across these different regions. If you attended the presentation last month, you saw the results for the lower Colorado and for the Eastern Book Trout Joint Venture region. And this table helps to summarize how different numbers of sites with fish data, temperature data, and flow data were um, big factors that needed to be considered in these respective projects. At the same time, in hearing Bill's talk today, for example, it's, he had a fairly good representation of lakes with phosphorus data, almost 30%, yet there are a large number of lakes for which those data are missing. A point I wanted to share about these projects is that despite the results they've generated for climate changes, they can also be used to potentially prioritize systems or areas in which additional data could be calculated. And um, I don't know if Bill mentioned this in his talk, but for example, his research group is considering ways to characterize phosphorus concentrations using Secchi disk depth. So again, these results can help guide how data are collected and modeled into the future. So all of these projects made the most of available data but in doing so, there was, in some cases, trial and error in terms of determining which approaches were most appropriate. Through that process, a lot of knowledge has been gained by the various researchers, some of which at least is going to be shared in various publications. Together, this suite of knowledge really does provide a great set of alternatives to potentially other researchers who may wish to conduct change evaluations in their respective regions. And again, they can look to some of these projects for guidance on how to work when data are more limited, when you wish to target response of a particular species, or for example, characterize specific changes in habitat. 
with this multifaceted analytical framework, one application coming from this project then, of course, is this notion of providing insights to new studies that, again, might be region-specific or species-specific. And I also want to emphasize the value of the spatial framework that all of the projects relied on. It's allowing us to do some next steps of actually looking at different project results in overlapping regions. How are they similar? Why are they different? Damon emphasized this in his talk as well. This spatial framework will easily allow us to bring in alternative data sets, new data such as alternative climate projections, um, new projected changes in land use, for example. And as Infan emphasized, these data together with other pieces of information, estimates of current conditions, socioeconomic data, data on conservation priorities, can really provide an enhanced view at multiple spatial scales for decision making. Certainly to the degree that we're talking about large scale efforts, these projects relied on data and input from a variety of agencies. This slide lists some of the main funders of the research, with first and foremost being the National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center. The following acknowledgments are more specific to individual projects and acknowledge at least some of the many people who contributed data and effort on this project. At this time, we'll sort of step back for any larger questions that people might have for specific researchers. And then if anybody has any questions, please go ahead and use the raise hand icon. Raise hand icon if you'd like to ask them through the phone or just put the check mark so I know that you're typing. Okay, we do have Gretchen typing. Gretchen writes, what has the response from managers been? Do they want to use this information to prioritize for protection, restoration, et cetera? Uh, yes, we have had, we have, have had um, some pretty good responses from, uh, from, man <coughs> excuse me, uh, from managers of uh, different agencies uh, in all three states, in fact. Um, I, I got uh, a pretty positive response from the Minnesota people last summer. Uh, with respect to the stream temperature, flow, and fish models. Um, so yeah, people people have been pretty interested to see this stuff, um, and uh, and I think there's a lot of interest in actually going forward with uh, developing some new predictions and um, maybe even incorporating them into some uh, future management planning. Um, one other thing that I'll throw in, these, uh, the data that I showed earlier, there's, there's obviously a lot more of them, but um, They've been incorporated into a, a landscape conservation cooperative project in the upper Midwest, Great Lakes LCC. Uh, and so these, these definitely are being used in other applications as well. Um, and there's a, a, a tool that's actually online or should be online at some point, uh, probably late summer, early fall. And that incorporates some of the results that, uh, that I've shown today in addition to uh, a lot more data actually from other um, AOGCMs and uh, and scenarios. All right, thank you. All right, I don't see any more questions. So, Dana, do you have any additional closing remarks? Um, just want to thank everyone for participating today. And I think I and any of the researchers who presented would welcome any of your questions after the fact. Definitely get a hold of us. And um, just a big thanks for showing up.
Thanks, Dana. And Sean, did you have any anything else to add? Uh, just my thanks to the speakers for some wonderful presentations. Much appreciated. Excellent. Thank you, Sean. And I'd also like to thank our presenters, all of them, and also uh, all of our participants.